and, and everyone who's making uh, their Wednesday afternoon here. Um, so I am a literary agent with the Stuart Kuchevsky Literary Agency in New York City, though I have been based here at my house in Yardley, Pennsylvania, just north of Philadelphia since March. Um, and I imagine I'll be here at this kitchen table that we no longer use for dinner <laughs> for quite some time at this point. Um, but I am happy to kind of give the Publishing 101 talk because I know that our business can be pretty opaque. Uh, I myself did not know that a literary agent was a, a thing or a job one could have until I was actually thinking about being a writer myself. And so that was how I even discovered that this job exists. Um, so maybe one of you will become an agent someday <laughs> after this talk. Um, but it is a really um, unknown business until you're beginning uh, to break into it. And so I'd rather give you the information that you need now uh, as you're beginning to think about what comes next. Um, so I think the best place to start is to just give you an overview of how people find agents and what agents do, because we are usually the first step in the book publishing process. Um, so I find clients in a variety of ways. The traditional way is via query, where um, you write a letter to someone that you think would represent you well. Um, Hi, I'm so-and-so, I've written this memoir, this novel, this is what it's about, this is why I think you might like it, because you represent this novelist who I love, or represented this narrative nonfiction project that I think is similar to mine. Would you be willing to take a look at my um, manuscript, here's 10 pages, whatever the agent asks for in their guidelines on their website. You include all of that and um, just send this blind email. I will tell you, not every agent reads their queries. Sometimes it's an assistant. I myself read all of mine, but you never know exactly who's going to be reading that. I'm sorry, I'm getting very dark. Let me see if I can move you over here. Okay, there we go. Now you can see my face. Um, so every agent will have guidelines on their website as to what they want in that query. And it's important to follow those <clears throat> to a T. Sometimes there's filters that they have in place. Sometimes an assistant will just go through and say, okay, this person listened, this person didn't. And so sometimes that's the easiest way just to make sure that you're getting in front of a reader. And then that reader is going to look at it anytime someone opens their query with a reason of why they're writing to me in particular. I immediately just have more of a connection than I would to a dear sir or madam or a dear hundred agents <laughs> in the business. So <clears throat> if you want someone to take your letter seriously, the best way to approach that is to, to uh, treat it as a personal introduction to this person to say, dear Mackenzie, I'm writing to you because I really admire this client of yours, or I read this book or this interview that you gave or whatever it is that has given you reason to seek me out because you should have a reason for each agent that you're querying. I sometimes get queries for books that I absolutely have never tried a hand at trying to sell. And so I know that I'm not the right agent for that person. What you don't want to find is someone who will just agree to represent you and then have no idea what they're doing because their primary job is to walk you through this business of publishing. And so they absolutely should have some idea of, you know, the, the genre you're working in, the sort of style you're aiming for. Um, so you should have a kind of targeted approach to that initial query. Um, so that's one way that you people find agents. Other ways are sometimes I will be reading material, whether it's op-eds in a newspaper, online viral articles, tweets. Um, I come across talented writers in all sorts of, uh, via all sorts of platforms. And sometimes if I see either multiple articles they've written that are all about a similar theme, or I just love this one thing in particular, I'll write to them and say, have you ever thought about writing a book? Could this particular idea be a book? Do you have a, an idea totally separate from what you've already written about, but I love your voice. And so sometimes <clears throat> it is the agent who kind of writes that initial uh, fan letter, which is usually the subject line that I use, um, to the writer to see if there's a, a book project in mind. Um, and so one of the things we can certainly talk about is platform building, because the larger your kind of publication footprint, for lack of a better term, the better you'll be positioned to catching the eye of an agent who's looking for material. And so if you're able to place an op-ed in say the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, that will certainly catch the eye of people who are actively trolling through those websites for content. Um, same thing if you're a memoirist writing a personal essay in a place like Slate or Bustle, could catch the eye of a totally different kind of agent. And so I think also aiming to publish work 
at outlets that actively reflect the sort of um, sensibility that you're after, that would attract the sort of reader that you're most hoping to cultivate. Those are important places to initially target your, pub your short form publication. Um, most editors, when they're looking to acquire a project, will hope that you have some sort of publication footprint, whether it is in traditional print media, or maybe you're constantly interviewed on podcasts, or you're in an organization like Blue Soup, some sort of um, what we call platform, some sort of um, evidence that you've been writing for a time, that other people have invested in what you have to say, that um, you're able to point to, well, this piece got 500,000 hits. Clearly, that means that there's an interest in this subject matter that you're able, that they're then able to tr turn around and say to their, you know, publicity and marketing teams, their sales force, that, look, this is a big idea because they've already done this work in this space. And I know we can build off of that because you really, when you are writing to the agent and the agent's writing to editors, it's one long game of telephone. So the amount of work that you can do up front to kind of build your profile, build your body of work, only helps each step after that, continue that good work to then eventually get it out to a readership that is shrinking. Um, I wish it weren't, but not as many people read books today as they once did. Um, or they're reading, or they're just competing for so many different kinds of formats. Obviously now we're competing against podcasts and um, I mean, so much good television and film um, that books are not quite being read in the way that they once did, but we're, we're making the good fight, fighting the good fight for. Um, so the other way that people will often find their way to an agent is via referral. So maybe you have a friend who's written a book or who works at a magazine who knows an agent. If someone writes to me and says, hey, I, I just you know encountered this writer, what do you think? they're looking for an agent, this is what their their manuscript is about, I'll always respond to that friend of mine because I value that relationship. And so it's also a faster way to kind of get my attention when I've got, you know, a handful of queries to look through and a bunch of things in my inbox. If it's coming from a trusted source, I will absolutely, you know, prioritize that, that note. It doesn't mean I'll always take that client on, but at least you get um, a really considered read. And that I think is also just a hurdle in general, the amount of of queries that agents get can be quite quite high and so anything that one can do to kind of just rise to the top of the pile is advantageous um, not everybody has a best friend novelist who can introduce you to their agent so joining communities like blue stoop taking classes with different writers um studying under under um anyone who's done this professionally can be helpful. Um, going to conferences back when we used to have them um, is another way you can sometimes get the opportunity to pitch an agent in person or even do like query feedback or manuscript feedback. Anytime you're able to get in front of someone, I think that often helps. Um, I sometimes receive queries that say, hey, X, Y, and Z editors are interested in seeing my work. I, I met them at um, this pitch contest or whatever it is. And that immediately kind of, again, gets my little spidey sense up of like, oh, okay, this person's already begun to make um, inroads into the business. Um, so those are usually the primary ways in which agents and writers kind of open up that dialogue. It's via referral, conferences, um, querying, and then just uh, the agent reaching out because the platform has reached a certain level and, and caught their eye. There are probably other wonkier ways. I was once queried on a massage table. I would not recommend that. <laughs> so I, I certainly think um, those are the traditional routes. I aim for those, but you never know. I mean, people always have ideas and um, agents are often really eager to hear them. So once you open up that dialogue with an agent, what often happens is the agent will evaluate the work. Is it right for them? Do they know who to send it to? Because again, their primary function is to find you an editor in a publishing house that will buy this book and support it through the publication. Um, do they have editorial thoughts? Do they have the same vision that the author has? These are all questions that I ask myself when I'm evaluating something because I can admire a project and know that I'm not the right agent for it because I know I don't do much adult fiction. And so if it's a really beautiful novel, I can appreciate that as a reader, but I don't have the connections that one would want in the literary fiction world or in the sci-fi fiction world or whatever it may be. And so you really do want to find a partner who has an expertise in what they're doing. I personally do mostly adult narrative nonfiction and that is a range, everything from memoir to serious history to pop psychology and anything in between food, uh, food writing and cookbooks. And then I do a small bit of um, young adult fiction as well and a little bit of poetry. 
Um, and there are agents who will make exceptions for certain things because it's just something they have to have or they, they have a, an interesting way into that, that work. But for the most part, you want to find someone who really understands what it is that you're after, has a history of selling that well and competitively, and has really deep relationships with people who publish those books. Um, and so you have an offer from an agent. Someone says, I would like to work with you. You don't have to accept that offer. Um, I've talked to lots of different authors at lots of different stages. And sometimes they took the first offer that came to them because it was very exciting and they thought it was the right step. And then halfway through the process, whether that's, you know, they're just doing edits or the agent sends it out to a few people and then gives up or whatever it may be, there's a reason why that partnership didn't work. And it's really devastating for the writer because in some cases that book goes on submission and the next agent can't go back to those people that the original agent sent it to. And so you really do wanna do your due diligence when deciding who to work with. Um, and some of that is just that initial homework of does this person you know, represent what I represent? Do they seem like a, a good advocate? But also ask to talk to their clients um, if they're interested in working with you, because then you can have a really candid conversation with them. Does it take a long time to hear back from email? How accessible are they? Have they ever helped you sort through a really difficult situation? You can ask really... Um, helpful questions of, of the things that you might imagine coming down the road, you know, do you trust them with the, with your money? They're also your business partner and that way we receive all money. So on behalf of our clients and then pay them out. You occasionally hear a horror story of an agent who never gave you your check. Um, and so just really asking candid um, questions of their other clients can be helpful. Same thing of their colleagues. Are there other agencies within their are there other agents within their agency that you'd ever have contact with? Is there an assistant that you'd have contact with? Who are they? Do they like this agent? You know, asking really um, blunt questions can be really helpful to you when you're trying to sort out who to work with. Um, ask them for their recent deals. You know, what other books have they sold? Who have they sold them to? What sort of advanced levels have they gotten for their clients? I mean, anything that's important to you in your work, ask them questions about that. Um, if there's a dispute about the cover, if there's a dispute about an editorial direction, how would they handle it? How have they handled it in the past? I mean, you can really ask anything. And if an agent is bristling at those questions, that's a red flag. Because if they want to work with you, they off, they need to qualify why they want to work with you and how they would represent you. Um, this is really meant to be a long-term business partnership. And so you want to make sure that you feel like you're in good hands. Um, so I really recommend asking any question that you that you have, being able to follow up afterwards, you know, say you guys have a phone call and you think of a few things later, please send those questions through. Um, I think the biggest mistake would be to just rush into the relationship because it's exciting and it is, but you want to make sure that you're in the right hands. Um, so then after you find your partner and you signed your agency agreement and you two are off to the races, there is a different amount of editorial work that each project will need and that each agent is willing to give. That's another question you can ask them. How editorially hands-on are you? Um, everybody offers different levels of that sort of, um, that sort of work. I myself love the editorial process. So it's something that I really like to do. That's not true of everyone. Um, so then you get to work editorially. If you're working on nonfiction, it's usually on book proposal. If you're working on um, fiction, it's usually a full manuscript. There are of course, um, exceptions, but usually that's the split. Um, and then you'll work with your agent for sometimes a few weeks, sometimes a few months, sometimes over a year to get that package right for submission because your agent really wants to make sure that they're only putting quality material out into the marketplace so that their relationships with editors remain strong. They're not that the editors on the other end are oh no, another project from this person. It's never, you know, polished enough. She's always sending me the weirdest things. Like you really want to make sure that that agent's reputation is to be sending around quality material, which is something that I actually learned from my boss early on that you, not everyone will always buy what you send out, but they'll always read it quickly if they, if they trust your taste and that you're sending them good, good material. So again, something else to talk to your potential uh, representative about. Um, and so after you're on submission, the, the agent has come up with a list of five to 20 editors who they think would you know, appreciate your work. It's the worst part of it. You have to wait and just see um, if someone will, will nibble, but usually editors will begin to respond and say, hey, I really like this. It's not for me. I loved it, but my publicity director shot it down. You'll start to get different levels of feedback. Sometimes you'll have multiple editors interested in something and you can strategize with your agent on what you need and want and how to proceed from there. There is the um, exciting auction, which is much like it sounds where people kind of raise their paddle and, and the numbers go up to, to take a project off the table. Um, but for the most part, 
most editors just make an offer and your agent will sort through those with you and you decide who you'd like to work with. And you can only work with one. So even though there are some really exciting, you know, stories that we hear about so-and-so preempting or going to a 13 house auction, that isn't the tr or the most common way that most books get sold. Usually there's one person who's interested in, or hopefully more than one, but still you can only work with one. And so getting an offer from someone that you admire who has a real vision for the work and whose publishing house is good at doing that sort of book is all you need. And so you, take that deal, your agent negotiates it to their best of their ability, and um, that's all sorts of terms, approvals over things, royalty rates, all sorts of um, kind of back-end details that an agent can walk you through that's not just the number that you see up front. And then you're off to the races with your editor. You get to do another round of editorial work, and if you're doing nonfiction, then the actual writing of the book. Um, eventually, once the book is finished and it's gone through its edits, it gets a, a cover, it gets publicity marketing materials and plans, and so your agent is also there to walk you through those different pieces. If there's an issue that comes up along the way, they can help advocate for a new draft of the cover, or, oh, this is a, an another author that I know who would blurb this book for you. And so you really begin to kind of put the pieces of publication into place and how to launch that book uh, into the world. And so this is also where sort of the platform that you already started to build can come back into play in a really strong way. What original pieces can you um, come up with to publish alongside the publication of the book that would draw attention to it? Um, is it an op-ed? Is it a personal essay? Is it an excerpt of the book and that you would coordinate with your publisher? There's lots of different strategies, but having an agent and also potentially even like writer friends to discuss it with, what's a good idea around my book? You know, I don't want to give away too much of what's in it, but I want people to be drawn to it. You know, how do I position myself as a writer? These are all questions or conversations you can have with your agent, but also with your writer friends. What did they do? Um, what was successful in their book launch? Because each project is so different. Each moment in, that a book comes out is really different. One of the primary struggles we've had in the last four to five years is how to get coverage for books in this news cycle. When you have pandemic news, constantly uprising news, the president, <laughs> the administration news that is um, just constantly taking what was once in the spotlight and, and throwing it to the side. And so your publicist could have the best laid plans of, oh, there's gonna be this big event on this day and it's gonna be tied into this news cycle. And then suddenly it is uh, totally different the day that you planned to, to launch these things. And so trying to be really nimble and creative with how you talk about your book, where you can talk about your book, who with, um, I think is a, a real advantage right now, just given how um, quickly things are moving, how, um, quickly people's attention is being pulled from different subjects to different subjects. Um, and so it's just been a lot to kind of, for people, especially who have been publishing books in the pandemic to kind of um, sort through, especially in those early weeks. Um, and so launching the book is primarily the publisher's job. Your publicity and marketing team will help get as many eyeballs on, on your cover and um, any interviews with you and, um, and the other original writing that comes out around that time to say, this is a book that you ought to buy. And then after that, you certainly can talk to your agent about different ways to kind of push the publisher along the way to say, hey, I know the book's been out for a month, but what can we do? This worked, this didn't work. Can we, can we pivot? Can we try this? Because um, publishers really do give the book usually somewhere between two to four weeks to really work. And then they've got the next set of books that they need to focus on. And so again, having a partner in it who can, you know, just remind the publisher, hey, but what about this idea? Or can we try this? Or, oh, the paperback is coming up. Here are some new ideas um, to just have someone else kind of walk you through what's possible, um, help you generate ideas can be really helpful. Same thing with having other writer friends. Really, I mean, things that worked for them in different moments, whether or not they're, they're appropriate for you remains to be discussed, but still just generating ideas can be really important. Um, and, ask, and asking the people uh, if they can put them into play for you. Um, and so once your first book is out, really you you can, after you deliver the first book, have that conversation, but then you really begin to, I think, plan long term as to what the next book is somewhere between delivering that first book and publishing it. Um, do you want to write the same kind of book? Did you have a good experience with your publisher? Would you like to remain working with them? Do you absolutely need a new editor because you guys just consistently were butting heads? Um, is there or are there different avenues for this book to live as a film and television property? Could it live as a podcast? Could it be 
a, a stage production, um, how is your, this is probably another question actually to ask when you're interviewing agents, what sort of um, situations do they have within their agency for film and television, for foreign rights? How do the agents themselves approach those conversations? Do they do everything at once? Do they do it over time? Um, what sort of deals have they done in those spaces as well? Important to know. Um, but that's something too that your agent along the way should help you exploit. Um, if there's a real narrative element to the book, maybe it could be a, a film or television show. If it's um, you know hard hitting news, like maybe it's a docu series, and do they have partners that they can help you um, connect with to explore those opportunities? Um, multimedia games. There are theme park rides made out of YA blockbusters, so you never know what you know could come of it down the line. So just talking early um, with your representative about what rights you'd like to retain or what you could possibly see uh, with your book down the line is really helpful. Um, and so after that book is out there, you have to think long term. What's the career? Do you want to keep doing the same sort of writing? Do you want to pivot to a totally different kind of book? If so, how do you do that? All of this comes into conversation with your agent and what sort of vision they have for you. I do know of a few people who have agents who are just for specific genres. So they have somebody who does their picture books and somebody else who does their serious history if they're really that different. But for the most part, you partner with a single person who can help guide you through those choices of what's going to make sense as a next project. How do we continue to build you, your audience, the, for lack of a better term, I hate this term, brand, but really your recognizability as an author. How do we continue to make you a bigger success from book to book is, is really a question that your agent should be asking with every decision you make um, and, and helping you kind of build whatever career it is that you want. That was a lot, I realize at once. <laughs> That's the, um, the full scope of query to publication. And I'm sure we've got Plenty of questions for Q&A after that ramble. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mackenzie. Yeah, so this would be a great time if you have a question that you wrote down while Mackenzie was speaking. Um, you can just unmute yourself and ask the question. I think that will be just fine. Or if you don't want to do that, you can also type questions into the chat. So does anyone have a further question or want to ask Mackenzie to elaborate on something that she just talked about? Um, I have I a question. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Sarah. Uh, sorry, did I talk over someone? Mm -mm. I only work from home, so I haven't done many Zooms, so <laughs> it's new to me. Um, Mackenzie, thanks so much for all the info. I was wondering, is there any site that has like an aggregate of literary agent reviews and ratings from their clients or anything like that? Not from their clients. I mean, there are some sort of like, I think Query Tracker is one that can help people track like who they've queried and whether or not they've gotten responses. There may be like, kind of like a rate your professor, there may be like rate your agent, but from people who usually don't work with those agents. And so I think the best resources really are like interviews um, that that agent has given, like how do they describe the work they do, um, any sort of professional organizations that they're a part of, like the AAR is the Association of Authors Representatives. I am a member, you don't have to be a member, um, there are some members who are much more active in, in professional groups like that. Somebody's on the head of the contracts committee, you know, they can talk about, you know, work they do in that way too. Um, but they should have a list, at least on the AAR website of everyone who's a member. Um, otherwise, manuscript wish list is actually another one that I should mention. It's hashtag um, MSWL on Twitter. And then there's also a site as well where people will, both editors and agents, kind of list out what they're actively hoping to see. And so again, not exactly a a rate your agent sort of um, site, but at least it gives you a little more of a window into what they're looking for. And you can probably parse mm -hmm. out like who is actually, you know, doing what genres in that way too. Um, people have definitely referenced in my posting, which is a little old and dated at this point, but inquiries and, and I always appreciate that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Awesome, other questions? I had a quick question. Um, thank you so much for all that info. Uh, I was, when you were talking about um, at what point things get published, so you're saying that non nonfiction stuff, um, you would maybe submit a proposal and then start writing and fiction needs to be fully written. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about um, the sort of state uh, a fiction manuscript should be in by the time you send it to an agent. 
Mm, sure. So, I mean, in general, I think anytime you're going to be approaching an agent, you should have taken that piece of work, whether it's a proposal or, or a manuscript, as far as you can take it. And so if that means, you know, sharing it with writer friends of yours, taking a creative class, just working on it as much as you can, you want it to feel like you've put your best foot forward and whatever that looks like. Um, and I mean, I do see things in various states, um, you know, just depending again on what the, the author was able to create. But if there's something there, you can even see it in the rough sometimes. And often agents will send back um, a sort of revise and resubmit if it's close, but maybe not quite there, that they're not able to commit quite yet. They want to see how you know the author responds to notes. Um, agents will do that sometimes to give you some feedback and say, you know, go back and do a little bit more, come back to me. Um, sometimes they'll be like, okay, I, I can see the heart of this. I know that I know what to do with it. I'll just dig in there with you. And, and so it really just depends on the agent, exactly the state of the manuscript, what have you. But I always just recommend take it as far as you can and then get it out there. So you have a question in the chat here about rights and reserving mm -hmm. rights in contracts. So are there other contract clauses we should look at closely other than reserving certain rights? <laughs> I'm sure there are many, but maybe you would mind, uh, you'd be willing to share some others. Sure. So there's lots of different contracts that you will likely have the opportunity to sign. I'll, I'll give you a high point of couple. So if you are just writing short form work to start, so essays, op-eds, what have you, I always advise against signing what's called a work for hire agreement. Um, sometimes the agreement will actually say those words in it. Sometimes they're a little bit trickier by saying that you are foregoing copyright or you are giving up all rights to the property or what have you. It's all sort of euphemistic language for saying that the New York Times gets to own everything basically and you have zero right to that material. Um, which then say it's a personal essay that you've written and then you'd like to turn that into a memoir. If they own the rights to that, it gets a little bit trickier for whether or not you can use any of that language in your book later. Um, same thing for essays. If you'd like to collect a bunch of essays, can you actually pull that from the website and, and use it again in, in your collection? So if there is a big enough platform and you think it's going to grow um, you know, your readership to a degree, sometimes I think it's okay, like modern love, in New York Times is one of the biggest columns that exists and they will not let you retain any film and television rights. I don't even think you can retain copyright. Sometimes that is, you know, a column that people are willing to say, okay, because it, it could just do so much for their career, but that's my recommendation. Only do it for the places that you think would, you know, just change your life basically because you don't want to lose the rights to your work. So just making sure that you retain copyright, um, film and television is big, especially because Hollywood studios are actively looking for short form content now um, in a way that they hadn't been before. Hollywood doesn't really like to read that much. <laughs> so the shorter the better. Um, and so uh, again, film and television, but like the New York Times, the, um, what's the other one that everybody publishes with? Oh, all the Condé Nast publications, they will not give up film and television rights. The Atlantic will if you push hard enough, long reads won't. And so some of it is just the, the outlets themselves just have policies. But if you have an agent, sometimes you're able to push or you know of an exception or what have you. So sometimes talking to your agent too, if you have one of, can they help you navigate some of the short form work too, in addition to your book stuff can be helpful. Um, in terms of agency agreements, um, definitely look at, you know, any sort of language that says, can you part ways? I mean, of course you can, but how easy do they make it for you to leave if you're not happy? Um, when you leave, what happens to all of the rights to the work that they either did or did not sell for you? Um, if they sold it for you and there are still some unsold foreign rights, for example, do you get to leave with those? Do those stay? If they stay, does the agent help you, you know, still exploit those things? Um, and listening to the agent's reasoning on all of those things is important too because each agency has very different um kind of opinions and, and shapes to their agreements um you should never be paying an agent directly they should only ever be taking commission out of earnings that you get and so that's also a huge red flag if for whatever reason it says like you owe me a check every month or what have you like that's not a traditional agency model um i should have mentioned earlier agents work almost solely on 15 percent commission and so they don't see money until the author does which really you know financially ties us together our um 
our goals are almost always the same in that way, um, which is, I think, the way it ought to be. Um, so that's something for an agency agreement that I would be really, um, you know, look at very carefully. Um, what else? Agency agreements. I think that's probably it. And then for publishing agreements, I mean, your agency will have likely negotiated with every major publisher. We have what's called boilerplates with Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster and what have you. And so most of our contracts for all of our clients look pretty much the same. It's really just the deal points, which are like the advance, the specific royalties, the delivery date, things like that. Those will be different from contract to contract. But for the most part, you just want to make sure that you work with an agency who has done business with all of the bigger houses because they have really well negotiated contracts over time. Um, so in that way, I don't think there's any publishing agreements that you'd really need to be aware of right now, unless you're publishing with maybe a small press, a, a university press, um, some, maybe you're, you're doing a, a small press and don't have an agent quite yet. So in that case for book rights, I mean, again, making sure that you're only giving the book publisher rights that they're actually going to exploit. So a book publisher is never going to exploit film or television. You should retain that certainly, um, Audio, it's sometimes if they have an audio publisher within their house, like Penguin Random House has Penguin Random House Audio, it makes sense to give them audio and they actually insist on it. But if it's someplace um, like a tiny press and you could then sell those rights to Audible on your own and make a lot of money because Audible throws a lot of money at everybody right now, um, then I would absolutely try to retain audio. Um, any other sort of dramatics of stage, documentary, et cetera, all of those to retain. Um, foreign rights, if they don't have someone in-house doing foreign rights at the publisher, then I would retain those as well. Because even if you find an agent, you know, months down the line, your small press book wins an award and someone writes to you, that sometimes happens, um, they would be able to help you exploit any rights that you didn't give to the publisher. So really trying to hone down exactly what that publisher can do um, and, and only giving them those rights. And out of print is a big clause as well. So if they're no longer able to sell copies for you, if it reaches a certain threshold, and usually it's a few hundred a year, then you ought to be able to get the rights back to potentially sell them to someone else later. Um, because you never know, you, you know, publish a book 10 years ago, suddenly it's the topic is, is back in vogue again, and you just had a big book come out, and now you can sell that book again to someone else, but only if you're able to get the rights back from that initial publisher. Um, so those are just a few tips if you're negotiating with a small press on your own. Was that helpful? I know that's a lot. Awesome, for sure. I'd love to jump in there, if that's okay. Sure. Oh, great. Thank you so much. That was so helpful. And um, uh, it, I haven't written that quickly since taking notes in graduate school. <laughs> So, I know, I talk uh, fast. So I want to give you as no, much as I can. That was amazing. It was my first foray into this, and I am just so blown away by the amount of material that you just covered. So I have a couple of related questions. We'll see what feels right or you have time for. Is there anything that um, someone should never do, the thing that would make you not want to work with that person ever? Um, dear Mr. Brady. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's great. <laughs> okay. Or the... On. Or the dear agent, and then you see every single one of your colleagues that you know CC'd. You know, I really, it's for me, wow. it's when someone is writing, you know, to you, you just want to one know that they at least know who you are to some degree, you know, um, and that they have a reason. But the only time I've ever been like actively turned off from working with someone, you know, I once maybe sent a past letter and they said, blah, as a response. And you're, and you're like, oh, okay, maybe I did dodge a bullet. So really, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a frustrating business. I totally get that. We all deal with a lot of rejection. I do too, you know, on behalf of my clients and it's frustrating every time. And yet, you know, just trying to comport yourself with some, um, some personality and, and, and some heart and just realize that like everyone is really trying to get good work out there is really just, you know, all we ask for. Okay. That's super helpful. And the targeted approach to the pitch was particularly helpful for me to hear the way that you want the kind of, you really have to research because, um, framing this as a long-term partnership is really beautiful because it's almost like you can grow together um, mm -hmm. as you're kind of figuring out your way through the years and through the different projects that might come. Are there any other tips different from what you've um, offered us that make uh, someone stand out from that plush pile if they're querying uh, yeah. that, makes, that catches your eye in particular if they've had a good clip in the, in the, time, mm -hmm. in the New York Times or um, putting that kind of front and center, or is that too much? You know? Yeah, no, I mean, so sometimes it's in the bio of saying, you know, I've been published in like 
30 different really amazing places, I'm always like, oh, okay, like I should maybe really pay attention because it's clearly other people have been reading this writer. Um, or, hey, I just had a piece hit a million views on YouTube. Like, okay, that's something that like, again, just it demonstrates that there's some kind of market. And so, yes, if there is, um, whether the idea itself has just gone viral or you've had a big piece recently, the opening with that is definitely fine. Otherwise, if putting it in your bio and making it very clear that you've been published in these places is helpful. Um, otherwise, I think the query itself and they're very hard to write, but to kind of have the ability to succinctly say what the book is and what you really are intending it to be is so helpful. I mean, because that's really all you get. It's a couple paragraphs to get in front of someone. And that's all I have too when I'm, you know, sending it to editors. And so if you can make that query as compelling as, as possible, and then I can add to that a little bit, and then the editor adds to that a little bit, the back of the book is going to sound really good. <laughs> but it, it really starts with you. You have to know what you want this book to be and what you want to do, because we are all taking our cues from the authors. You know, really, what is this thing that they're trying to create, and do we know how to help them do it? Um, so the more certain you are, the easier it is for us to evaluate it and to help. So how many writers would you work with at one time? Because it sounds like a really labor intensive relationship where you're um, investing a lot of energy and attention and getting to know each client. That's actually a really good question to ask a potential agent as well. Like how many clients do you have? And it will vary dramatically. I mean, some keep as little as like 20, some have like a hundred, some have hundreds, which I don't actually know how they keep their, you know, heads above water, but no, no full list is ever going to be active at the same time. I mean, I've got authors who will sometimes take five years to write a book. And so they're just like off doing that. And I don't really need to be involved so much when that's happening. Others, you know, you've got three books launching in a season and it's really busy to help do that. So, I mean, I myself, I think I have like about 35 or so, and I'm still looking for more, but not all my clients are even working at the moment. Some have published two books and are just, you know, stuck for their next idea. And so it really, it just like depends season to season on like who actually is working at that time. But I think it's important to ask, you know, that agent, like, how do you balance your clients? I mean, I also have other things in my life that I need to accomplish too. And I really like to maintain that balance. And so for me, it's, I really only try to take on something if I know what I'm doing and have the bandwidth for it, because it's not to anyone's advantage for me to just like take something on and then sit on it for six months. That's not going to help anyone. But, you know, asking those questions early, I think it'd be illuminating. Thank you so much. So helpful. I can't tell you. Sure. I'm so glad. Awesome. Other folks want to jump in or type in the chat? Let's see. This person says, if you have an extensive, let's say 150,000 nonfiction work, how much do you reveal to potential agents? How do you protect your creativity so that an agent doesn't pass it along to another writer they already represent or favor? Mm. Well, I, I mean, that's a particularly unethical thing to do for an agent to take someone's work and to pass it along. I mean, I don't know how you kind of protect yourself from that, but most of us aren't in the business of, you know, harming other writers' careers. Um, I mean, there are certainly instances where like, oh, so-and-so has a project that's too similar. Okay, I'm not going to take that on. You know, we do certainly talk to each other about what people are sending out and, and what's going on to kind of inform our discussions. But I, I can't ever recall an instance where someone like, took an author's idea. Um, I mean, I would say 150,000 words is really long. Most books really are only like 80 to 100. There are exceptions, of course, but if I'm just, for me personally, if I were to see an query, I have a 150,000 word manuscript, I'd be like, ooh, that is gonna require an awful lot of legwork on my end to get that down to a sort of limit that I would be able to actually work with. And so for me, that is a bit of a red flag of like, that's going to require a lot. Maybe the author hasn't done as much as they need to on their end. Maybe it's specific to the topic. Maybe it has to be that long. So I say this kind of just generally, but I do think you really wanna aim usually for no more than like 100, 110. Again, there are exceptions. Um, but in terms of how much you reveal, I mean, most agents only ask for 10 pages, maybe less in their initial kind of query. And so, you know, you have got the query letter, you have your attachment or in the body of the email, a little bit of the sample. Sometimes they'll ask for 50 pages after that. Sometimes they ask for the whole thing. I mean, if you want to work with that person, you have to kind of take that leap of faith. You could, um, you know, put I mean, this isn't help for protecting the idea, but you could certainly like watermark the pages themselves if you're worried about somehow the manuscript itself leaking. Um, other than that, there isn't much, I think, that you can do. You just have to kind of trust that the people that you're writing to, and that's where sort of, sort of like reputation research can come into play of, you know, do you trust this person to even look at it? Okay. 
Yeah, there's actually a couple other questions I missed here too. Yep. Sorry about that. So this says, I've seen book proposals that say deliverable within X X months of signing. What kind of time frame are agents or publishers looking for? So you don't even have to put that in the book proposal. I mean, you can, but it's always going to be a conversation for every single project. Um, traditionally, like most authors say somewhere between like a year and 18 months. Sometimes if they're really trying to like rush it out for a specific reason, they can say like, I can get this done in three months because it's going to hit this, you know, election deadline or, or whatever it may be. Um, I will also say it's usually a year between delivering a final manuscript that is ready, like fully edited, um, going into copy editing to its publication. And so publishing is a very slow process. Um, you can rush it if there's a reason to, but for the most part, most publishers like to have about a year, nine months to a year. Um, so in terms of delivery date, I mean, I've never seen an editor bulk at 18 months. Some authors need a year or two to three years up front. They know that they're a historian. They're going to take a decade. Like sometimes this is just a conversation that has to happen. But if the work is there and the editor wants to buy it, the delivery date is usually a pretty easy conversation. They want the work to be good. Absolutely. Okay, awesome. Here's someone with a question about query letters a bit more specifically. What differences might there be in a successful query letter for a nonfiction project versus a fiction project? Do mm. agents have different expectations for a fiction versus nonfiction writers publishing footprint or platform when the author is at the query stage? So I do think I mean, a debut novelist is often a little bit easier to sell without a ton of bylines. If like the voice is there, the concept is, you know, too good to be true. Um, I think it still helps if you say, you know, publish some short stories or even personal essays, just something to kind of to begin to develop a readership. But I think you can often like say, this is a fresh new voice with this amazing story because you tend to sell, you know, fiction on the premise. You know, what is this hook that you're going to you know, have on the back of the book that gets the reader to buy it? Nonfiction, especially if it's prescriptive at all, like it's who's the expert, who follows them, you know, what sort of, um, again, for lack of a better word, that platform do they have? Are they the USA Today health columnist and they're writing a diet book? Like that makes a lot of sense. Clearly people already come to them for this sort of information. Um, and so in that case, I think for prescriptive nonfiction in particular, it's, you know, what sort of expertise do they have? What sort of following do they have? And then if it's narrative, that's where really like bylines come into play, I think more than anything else. Um, and saying, you know, all of these different outlets have, you know, agreed that I'm a good writer, have published my work, or I'm a columnist here and have a really deep fan base here. Um, and so in terms of what you put in your bio in the query letter, that's kind of the differentiation between the two. The actual query letters themselves will often sound pretty similar, especially for a narrative nonfiction and a, um, and a fiction. You know, what's the story? How are you spinning it for me? What's the sort of voice that you would be employing in the pages as well? Usually your query reflects that at least to a degree. Um, if it's, you know, a thriller, likely your um, query letters be like slightly suspenseful, you know. Um, Studying back of book jacket copy is actually really helpful for a query letter. It doesn't have to sound exactly like that, but it kind of does. Like you really just want to give the agent like a tease of, you know, what does this, what is this setup going to be like? And then they want to read more and that's how they find new pages. Um, comp titles, which is comparable titles is really helpful to get into your query letter. So my memoir is like this ex bestselling memoir meets this other bestselling memoir in this person's voice. I mean, we kind of make a joke out of comps at a certain point because everyone picks the same few. And so you absolutely want to pick books that were successful and you can figure that out by like, were they New York Times bestsellers? Um, did they get rave reviews in a lot of magazines? Did they, um, you know, end up on a bunch of best of lists at the end of the year? Like those are kind of the hallmarks to be able to tell that like, yes, this book is likely one that sold well because an agent has to use comps in their pitch letter or in the proposal, what have you to explain um, to the editors that this is going to follow a similar trajectory because of an editor has to actually use numbers that already exist to run their advanced numbers um, on their profit and loss sheet, which is how they even figure out whether they can offer on the book. So really comps are so important. I will try to dig this up before we close tonight, but there's an excellent piece in I think the LA review of books about the problem with comp titles, which is basically um, the same problem in text called pattern matching, which basically is like, you know, if you only publish rich white guys, then they're only the ones that have room to be successful. And so we only keep using the same comps and we keep publishing the same voices and what have you. And so comps are not a perfect system, but they're the system that we have right now. And so knowing your genre really well, knowing what, um, 
what other authors, you know, your voice is comparable to knowing what other audiences you're trying to attract is really helpful. Um, other than that, it's really just succinctly talking about the book and making sure that the person who's on the other end, like, gets what you're saying. So, you know, you may be a really beautiful lyrical writer, but if you can't like succinctly tell me what it is, it's going to be hard for me to be like, okay, but you know, what are we actually after? You know, what's the concept? Um, and so, because you really only have a couple paragraphs to kind of get someone to go to the next part, which is the read the pages. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And I just dropped the um, link to the LA Review of Books piece um, in the chat. Uh, really yeah, worth so, reading. Yeah. Awesome. Let's get Stephen and then I see a question in the chat from Deborah too. Go ahead. Hey, Mackenzie, thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering if you can say more about uh, poetry sure. and um, what you're able to do for poets and if the process of meeting an agent is at all different for poets than for prose writers. Yeah, so I think it depends on, I mean, I hate to say like what kind of poetry, only because the sort of Instagram poetry is having a moment. And so suddenly publishers are dropping like high six figures on, you know, Rupi Carr and, and the like, because they come with a million plus followers. And so it's less about, you know, the quality of the craft. It's really like, we are going to push this book to these followers and we'll make our money that way. And so that's one model of poetry publishing right now. Um, and then you have your more traditional, you know, your literary houses, Tin House is doing some of the best work right now, Grey Wolf, you know, your FSGs and HMHs that have always been publishing poetry. Um, it is a bit of a funny story. I mean, I think people are more open to poetry, even in YA. Um, like Elizabeth Acevedo, her first YA novel had a lot, was a lot in verse. And so there are definitely, I think, opportunities for different genres and, and to mix in poetry too. Um, so if you are aiming for, I guess, like either a first collection, it's, I think, to spread the seeds like you would for um, for essays as well. See what sort of bylines you can get with sort of magazines you can publish your poetry. That certainly helps, um, much like it does for every other genre. Um, I know that there are a lot of poetry contests that can also help in terms of like getting that first book out there maybe with a university press and just getting the reviews that you can build then to kind of entice one of these larger publishers to, um, to come on board. I represented a poet six or seven years ago, who was a Guggenheim fellow, had been published in the New Yorker, had like all of these amazing bylines. I couldn't give away her poetry collection to anyone. Um, I mean, like FSG at the time was like, we have our, our poetry slate up through 2017. And this was like in 2012 or something. And I was like, oh, okay. And so the, I think the number of publishers that were open to publish, open to publishing poetry was smaller than it is now. I think because you have some of your poppier poets and then also people who are sitting more in the middle. Um, so publishing programs are getting, um, I think, more accepting of poets as well, which is nice. I think there are still some really excellent small houses doing great work and they're often, you know, winning all of the awards from year to year. And so there's no one way to, I think, go about it. I think just talking again about what your work is, the sort of themes that you're exploring, the bylines you've got. Um, you know, I do see more poetry queries than I ever have before. And I sold a poetry collection two years ago in a 10 house auction. So sometimes it can really turn <laughs> in a couple years. Um, it just depends. And in that case, the author's first collection had sold really well from a small publisher. I was able to call up, you know, big five publishers and say, this has already sold 26,000 copies out of a tiny little press. Like, what do you think you could do? You know, and then they were like, oh, we could do a lot. Um, she had performed at, a, at an event and one of her poems had gone viral, had had like a million hits. And so like, those are just things that I was able to give to these, you know, publishers to entice them to take on a book that maybe they hadn't ever explored poetry on their list before. Um, this is all to say, it's, it's like a new ground that publishers are trying to break right now, which is exciting, but that also just means that they're all trying to figure it out. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah. And speaking of new ground, um, you have this question here in the chat says, I recently saw a call for an unagented work, a new term for me. Are you seeing any new trends emerging in this period of history? And I think if I'm not mistaken, this is specifically publishing houses saying, you know, we'll accept books by black writers in this moment of reckoning and acknowledging um, publishing so white. So I'm wondering if you um, want to just talk briefly as well about um, uh, your work with Included and thinking about um, the ways that maybe this current moment could be really cool for seeing more diverse books. Absolutely. I'm not sure if I'd seen the same call, but I mean, un unagented is essentially just you directly from the author. You don't have a representative. Um, 
if it's the one t tweet that I had seen, it was from an editor at a big publishing house who was open to reviewing that work directly. And they said if they were interested, they would pair you with an agent, which I really appreciated because you still want to have someone protecting your best interests. Um, sometimes when you are doing deals directly with the publisher, I mean, they will, you know, work out a deal that's favorable to them. And so regardless of who you are and when you're, you know, coming into contact with the publisher, I think you should likely have someone, you know, fighting on your behalf when it comes time for a deal. That being said, it's wonderful that they're willing to review work from people who are not agented. Um, and as far as, you know, where publishing is right now and where we're going, I mean, there's lots of conversations that are happening at every level, whether it's within small agencies, within the larger publishing houses. I mean, Macmillan actually just totally redid their sort of hierarchy and no longer has like the exact structure that most of the others have with like their executive levels. They now have a sort of executive committee that has, I think, six different people, most of whom are people of color. This is a, a new kind of organizational structure that they're trying out. We'll see if that makes a difference. I think people are willing to experiment within the sort of corporate structures in a way that I haven't seen before. Um, I am a founding board member of um, the publishing nonprofit called Included with a K. Um, we're at getincludedwithak.com. And one of our kind of capstone initiatives has been to kind of model the Columbia Publishing course, which is like, $15,000 course for six weeks in the summertime, um, which is basically like a pipeline straight into our business. So people who graduate from that course, one have met with agents and editors along the way because those are people who often visit that course or, or um, teach in that course. And then, you know, the mentors of that organization are often just talking straight to the HR departments of publishing houses and agencies and it's just, it's such an intensive program that people know that that assistant would be coming with a lot of knowledge, which is a really attractive when you're hiring someone. And yet the amount of people who can actually afford a $15,000 course for six weeks in the summer is a really small amount of people. So we have crafted, we did our first um, session last summer for, I think we do it for eight weeks. And um, we had six students. This year we have 11. So we're already growing and I'm glad that this year we were able to do it remotely actually because now you don't have to be in New York City to actually participate which is really exciting because I do think that's its own issue the fact that New York is the kind of the hub of, of publishing um, but we teach the students basically what an agent does what an editor does what sales and marketing does I mean I still don't know some of that information <laughs> so they come out of this group just knowing so much more than I ever did especially when I was first looking for a job and can also really target what they want to do and kind of have um, I guess enough knowledge to say like oh I would actually be really good at foreign rights oh I think I would like to be a scout and so much of, about our business I think is that no one even knows what really happens within it even when you are already in it I mean there are definitely roles in publishing that I still don't know exactly how a cover designer does their job maybe I would have liked that better you know and so one of our in addition to kind of creating this course that is um, you know meant to be a real feeder into the business for people who would never be able to you know attend the university-based courses and that are so expensive um, is is to kind of also just demystify with the different roles in the industry, get more information out to so the people even know that they would want to pursue a career in publishing. I think it feels um, like a sort of gilded tower and it ought not to be. And so if we can just kind of, again, spread the word as to like what publishing is, what it does, um, this is how you might get involved. We're trying to create sort of um, like syllabi that you don't even have to go to our academy for, that you can just kind of get a one sheet on an agent, a one sheet on an editor, and just kind of absorb information via our website too, just because we're just trying to get the word out about, you know, this is what we do and this is why it's cool and maybe you would like to do it too. Um, and I'm reaching out to different groups too uh, and different organizations and, um, and uh, advocacy groups to kind of just spread the word that we're even here um, and, and doing that. So we've been around for a few years, but just these last two years uh, with this academy have been really exciting to um, hopefully just change the demographic within publishing. Um, I mean, there are certainly people of color working in publishing already, but also the sort of challenges that they face on a day-to-day -day basis at whatever level they are, are much higher than people like myself. And so also trying to figure out ways to support our colleagues within the business, whether that's mentorship programs or just safe spaces or um, kind of reporting to us if they're not comfortable reporting to their HR departments or whatever it may be, just kind of keeping um, 
as much dialogue happening as possible and trying to hold the powers um, at the to account. We've just recently written to a lot of the diversity and inclusion committees to say like, hey, what are you guys doing? This is what we're doing. How can we partner? How can we, you know, kind of just check in and make sure everyone's doing what they say they're you know, doing. Um, it's still early days. We're all trying to figure out what's actually going to help move the needle. I mean, the Lee and Lowe study that comes out every year is a huge piece of that. Just to even say like, this is where we are. This is where we're getting better. This is where we're absolutely not getting better. I mean, data definitely helps. Um, but otherwise, it's really just trying to open as many doors. And then once people are in them, like keep them there because retention regardless of who you are, is abysmal in publishing because the salaries are low and New York City is expensive and the work is hard and long. And so it doesn't matter who you are, it's hard. But obviously, you know, the more challenges you put on someone's shoulders, just the harder it's going to be. So we're just trying to take some of that burden off when we can. Absolutely. That's so great. I'm really glad that, to hear more about that work. And um, yeah, I think that it's heartening to see that in this moment of hopefully reckoning, there's a lot of alternative conversations starting to pop up. I mean, yeah, honored to be here and even excited about this conversation. And part of Blue Soup's mission is to think too about, you know, we're not in New York, but how can we still get our needs met and keep people here and um, keep writers paid and satisfied and in community with each other here in Philadelphia. So um, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, you have one last question and uh, just about memoir. And I think this might apply to um, essay collections as well, but is there, hmm. are, do people expect memoirs and essay collections to be finished? by the time they're seeking an agent? Or is, I think the person asked, is there any you know, downside to finishing your memoir before you query? You know, memoir is kind of a personal preference, I find. I mean, usually the reason why you're selling nonfiction on proposal is because either that person has to take like book leave from their journalism job, or they have to do a lot of reporting that costs a lot of money because they have to travel and take time off. Um, and so that's why they need the kind of commitment upfront from the publisher before they actually write the book. I mean, I'm sure most fiction writers would also love the commitment up front before they go and do the work, but for whatever reason, this is how it's been set up. And so this is how it often works. Um, but I think for essays, as long as you have a handful, so I don't think you have to have all of them, but if at least you have enough to really show like how the voice will vary, how the themes are building upon themselves, like to really kind of get a sense of the range, if there will be, you know, a real difference between what you're kind of putting in this collection and then a plan for what else would go in there. I think you could get away with a proposal, especially if some of those essays have been published in really prominent places and, you know, um, you can again, demonstrate that readership there. And for memoir, I think again, it, if it's this really lyrical, beautiful piece of writing that has a really commanding ending, I mean, I think writing the whole thing is not a bad thing because if you just want this person to sink into this voice and, and, and fall in love with the story, especially if it's a little quieter and less kind of concept driven, I think that's a really lovely way to do it. If you have just a very dramatic story that can succinctly be boiled down into a page and then, you know, you want to have a chapter or so and kind of the outline of how you would, you know, write the story, I think you could probably get a publisher on board with a, a much shorter memoir. Um, that's true if there's also like some awareness around who you are already. I mean, obviously you don't have to be a celebrity, but if you are a Twitter personality that people kind of follow and know to a degree uh, personally already, or if, um, if you've published personal essays for a really long time, but are now going to write your full memoir, you know, people already have a sense of who you are, then it's a little easier to do proposal as well, because I think there's already just like a baseline understanding and, uh, of who you are and, and your body of work. Awesome. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I think I, I have one question for, for that came in privately that I'm happy to answer. And it was to say, how do you find agents who would be looking for work that you do? Check the acknowledgements of any book that you feel is remotely similar to yours and see who both edited it and agented it. Obviously the editor, I mean, your agent will have their own relationships and ideas about where to send it. But uh, they almost always thank their agents. And so you can get a sense of like, oh, well, if she liked this or she represented this book and it did really well and I loved it, you know, this, um, this agent might be open to my work. It also helps you when you're writing to them too, to say like, oh, I read this book of yours. You know, I really appreciated it. Um, especially if it's not like that person's biggest hit. I love when I get, you know, a letter from someone's like, I read this book that like maybe didn't perform so, so, so well, but this person found it and they liked it. You know, it's always really lovely to get that too. Um, but I would say acknowledgements is a really helpful place to start. Yeah, and, most, and if you Google a writer too, almost always they have their literary representation on their website. So, right, it's like if you find an author who, whose work you think is similar to yours, that's, I've done a lot of stalking that way too. So. Absolutely, <laughs> stalk away. But thank you so much. I think this is basically all we have time for. Um, 
I really just want to thank Mackenzie so much for being here with us today. And it's nice to see all of your faces here too. And if this is your first time at Wednesdays on the Stoop, we have this hour of um, informal programming and it's usually free. Generously, you all donated today. Your ticket money goes to Blue Stoop's um, COVID and Solidarity Fundraiser, which helps us to essentially pay our staff a living wage and also to um, create scholarships for people that want to take our eight-week craft courses um, at a reduced rate. So thank you all so much for donating that money. And we're at bluestoop.org and on uh, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at bluestoopphl. So thanks so much for being here today. And um, hopefully we'll see you again soon. And thank you, Mackenzie. Great. I'll actually put my um, Twitter and, and agency website info into the thing if anyone wants to follow up with any questions. That would be great. Thank you so much. All yeah, right. I'll leave chat open for a couple minutes. Thank you all. Have a great one.